I'm Laszlo Monta, and you are listening to The Change Log. Welcome back, everyone. This is The Change Log, and I'm your host, Adam Stachowiak. This is episode 186, and on today's show, we're talking to Laszlo Monda, also known as Lati. He's building the ultimate hacking keyboard. That's right. The ultimate hacking keyboard, also known as UHK. We talked all aspects, hardware, software, the open source around it, how it's a platform for hackers to hack on and make it their own. We also had four awesome sponsors, Codeship, TopTal, Harvest, and also Linode. Our first sponsor is Codeship, and they've got an awesome ebook, totally for free for you to download today. Head to resources.codeship.com slash ebooks and you're going to see a book there called Why Containers and Docker Are the Future. Now, this ebook is going to help you learn what the differences are between the traditional virtual machine and container stacks. You'll also learn about Docker and its ecosystem and why it's such a big deal. And you'll also learn about Docker and its community and how they're helping to standardize the container workflow. Now, you can go to resources.codeship.com slash ebooks right now and download this ebook. And I shouldn't tell you this, but when you do that, you're gonna get access to three other eBooks from Codeship, diving deep into Docker, continuous delivery, and how to do all this with native Docker support. Head to resources.codeship.com slash eBooks and download those eBooks right now, or head to our show notes for the link. And now onto the show. Everyone, I'm uh, here joined today by Lasso Manda, uh, also known as Lazi. And now maybe, Lazo, you can describe, because you're Hungarian, how names work for you. Yes, so in Hungary, and the first name comes last, and the last name comes first. So in, in Hungary, I'm Mondo Laszlo, and uh, in the US, I'm Laszlo Monda. So which one is actually your first name then? Laszlo. Laszlo, okay. But your friends and uh, the Hungarian nickname for you is Lati. Yep, exactly. And so for this show, I'm going to call you Lati. Okay, thank you. That's, that's awesome. I like that. Well, you know, we like to be very personal with our guests around here at the Change Law. We love, you know, not just the software you produce and the community that, just, that thrives around that software and what gets open sourced and uh, the education you share, but we also care about our guests and... Uh, you know, one of the things we love most is just kind of diving deep into the past of a guest. Now, maybe to set up the topic at hand, though, is we're going to be talking mainly about this keyboard you've made. This ultimate hacking keyboard is what the name of it is. Yep. And if I can recall correctly, in Changelaw Weekly, uh, issue number 36, we linked to a post that you shared on the Top Tile blog called From the Ground Up. How I Built the Developer's Dream Keyboard. And that was the number one clicked link. And for those out there listening to the show that subscribe to Change Law Weekly, we have sponsored links in there and they're clearly marked. This was a sponsored link and it was the number one link in the entire email. So we were pretty stoked about that. What did, what did you think about that? Did you, did you even know about that? Not really. I, I, it, it was crazy because the attention that, uh, that the post got was way above our expectations. And, and it got reposted in various sites and it, uh, it uh, gave us about 2,000 2, subscribers. So and when we talk about some days too for that post, that post was posted on, let's see if I can see the date here. Um, I can't tell a date, but I know that changelog 36 came out around the same time of that post. And that was in January of seventeen, January seventeenth of this year. So, all all year long, you've been working hard at this. You wrote that blog post on on uh, the Top Tile blog, and you're also part of the Top Tile network. So, dog fooding here a little bit. A uh, little disclosure to you and the listeners: Top Tile has been a sponsor of this show for many years now. Uh, they love what we do here. They support almost every single show, but we have a deep partnership with with Top Tile, and they're actually sponsoring this show in particular. Just by happenstance, they didn't even know that you were coming on the show, but you're also part of the Top Tile network. Can you speak a little bit about uh, your experience so far at Top Tile? So I went through their interview process and became part of the network. I haven't yet worked uh, through Top Tile. I, I uh, 
created a couple of uh, blog posts on, on their blog, and this was the, the more popular, most popular so far. So I was talking to Anna, who is also a, a top tail member, and she mentioned me that I should really uh, write a blog post uh, yeah. to the top tail blog. And, and for what uh, I gathered, I've talked to Brennan uh, Beneshot, the co-founder and CTO, or COO, as a matter of fact, and you probably know Brennan. Yep. Um, but part of the Top Town Network isn't just about helping developers get plugged into actual paying gigs where you're getting projects. It's also becoming a part of this, you know, worldwide developer network. And I really don't want to make this an ad for them, but I think this is really interesting because this is a, a chance for us to talk to and top teller are here on the show mm-hmm. and share a bit about, you know, what their process is and kind of how you stepped into that. And while you may not have taken on any engagements, you've blogged. And as you'd mentioned, this particular blog post that we covered in Change Law Weekly issue 36 was huge for you. So what was the, yeah. the ramifications? What came from that initial blog post about this project? Well, uh, what do you mean by uh, saying ramifications? Well, when I say like what, uh, what was the ripple effect? So you posted the blog post. We obviously covered it. Who else found interest in this post and was like, wow, this is really interesting. Okay. So this, uh, post, get, this, uh, this post got featured on the blog. And then I, I think the, the blog has, the top tab blog has 7,000 uh, subscribers or yeah. viewers. So it got huge attention. <clears throat> and if you see at the end of the post, there are dozens of comments. And then it got reposted on, there is a site java.dzone.com where it, it received a huge attention again. And then I, I sent it to slash that where it got featured on the main page. Wow. So it, it was a huge ripple effect for sure. And it helped us tremendously. And, gotcha. and we got our 2000 subscribers just, just based on this one post. Now, as our listeners know, we do like to dive a little deeper into the the past and history of our guests. And like I said, this uh, ultimate hacking keyboard is the main topic. I got a couple more questions that kind of, you know, kind of tee that up a bit. But we're, we are going to dive deeper into your past a bit and find out where you came from. But if I go back to this blog post and listeners will have this in the show notes for the show. So as you know, go ahead and head there. Look for the post from the ground up how I built the developer's keyboard or dream keyboard. And you'll see the post we're talking about if you want to follow along. But if I look through this post, it's talking about Arduino it, it, and the look of the keyboard that, that's being shown here is different than the look of the keyboard. Now, what stage was the, was this keyboard in? What was the stage of the project when this post went out? Was it early? Was it still not quite where it's at today? Yeah. Uh... I guess that that was our third generation prototype that we we, we featured in that post. And uh, back then the two ha- uh, keyboard halves were connected by a retractable cable, which had a totally different look th- than the current uh, cord cable. It's, it's like a telephone cord right yeah. now, but shorter. And the spiral was, cable. Yep, yep. Yeah. I kind of like that better. I, I can imagine, I haven't touched it yet. To know, but I feel like that's a better kind of cable. Absolutely. Which is why I asked you that, because it does look a lot different. Yeah. So those, those uh, retractable cables uh, failed on us like, it's, like there is no tomorrow. Right. <laughs> the, those, were, those were super unreliable. And the funny thing is that uh, there is a manufacturer uh, on the market who says they <laughs> keep their keyboards with, with, with that cable. <laughs> and it's, uh, some customers complain, uh, but it's reliable. And, and, uh, because we had so many iterations with our prototype, we, we were t- able to, to throw that, uh, cable and, and use another one that is actually uh, reliable. So we won't have uh, co- complaints later on. Gotcha. Well, let's see. I mean. I think the listeners have got enough so far to understand that um, English might not be your native language, your first speaking language. Yep. Um, and I, I find it all, all very interesting. Like the last show we had, uh, 
episode 185, if I belong, if I recall correctly. Let me go back to my notes real quick. Um, we talked to Ahmadness Re, uh, who is from Syria originally, and he had this really rich story of how he came to software, how using the internet was illegal in Syria, but yet he wow. found and others found a way around hurdles. And you can take that same conversation we had in the last show and take it back to Mitchell Hashimoto and several other guests we've had that have been influential software developers that come on the show. Um, maybe I teed that up in a good way, maybe a bad way, but what, what is it about your history? You're from, from Hungary. What can you share about where you came from to get to being a software developer? What's the, where should we start with that? Well, I, I uh, got my first computer in the age of six. It was a Com Commodore 64. And uh, from that point, there was no going back. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just the, I, I guess I'm just the geeky type who likes to tinker. And uh, programming pretty much, much allows this. You can break down problems and solve them. And uh, it's, it just makes sense to me and it's attractive to me. And uh, later I, I got my first PC and around the uh, year 2000, uh, broadband internet access became widespread in Hungary. And I, I got into web programming and over the years I, I used a large, large number of languages, Java, .NET, Python, JavaScript, uh, PowerShell, and uh, I, I wrote all kinds of applications, G GUI, command line, client server, and lately programming microcontrollers and, and understanding the, the various layers of the software stack. And I guess I'm, I'm pretty much full stack Pretty much full stack. I would think so. I mean, here in uh, all the languages and things you've messed with, that's definitely, uh, definitely full stack. And I think it depends on who you talk to, what full stack means. I would actually probably label you polyglot more than full stack, even though full stack <laughs> is a better, probably, mm -hmm. you know, totally accurate. I think full stack mm -hmm. is sometimes used to describe somebody on the web, potentially that's, you know, backend database, you know, yep. ops, front end design, even. Um, but uh, m maybe polyglot. What do you think about polyglot? Yeah, I think it's a it, it's it's a better term in my in my case because uh, it's not only the UHK is not only about programming but also about uh, designing hardware and soldering microcontrollers on the circuit board. So yeah, <laughs> polyglot is a better term, I believe. So whenever um, whenever you look at a problem. And, uh, and that problem involves design, software. How do you first think about it? Do you think, uh, you know, how do you reverse engineer a problem to say, this is the language I would use, and I would use this feature, this feature, and this feature. How do you approach some of the things you've done here? Or maybe even some of the first problems you had whenever you were first learning a program? Oh, geez, it was such a long time ago. Uh, we have so much more opportunities right now. And nowadays I, I, I use JavaScript whenever possible because it, it, it's so easy to prototype stuff in JavaScript. But, well, back then I, I used basic for the Commodore and, uh, and learned C and, and then scripting languages and, and realized how much easier it is, how much easier it is to achieve to, to solve pro problems in scripting languages? It's a pretty general question that yeah. you asked, and then I'm not sure how to answer it. Well, I think from the polyglot standpoint, you know, whenever, okay, let's, let's maybe, instead of going back in the past, let's, let's state it now, or in the last few years, whenever, as a polyglot, when you look at a problem, what are, you know, how do you, you know, for those out there who may not know what a polyglot is, or have an idea, want to be one, uh, which is someone who loves and knows many languages and can look at a problem agnostically and say, well, I'd use this language for this problem or I would use that for that. How do you think about things like that? Yeah, I, I guess uh, lately I had to learn so, so, so many stuff that I ended up using mainly JavaScript. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so JavaScript the, is your thing now? 
Yep. Yeah, because uh, earlier I used Python for certain purposes and then Node became widespread and the, the whole uh, library, JavaScript library ecosystem got so rich that I realized that I can solve almost any problem that I encounter with JavaScript and I, uh, I adapted it as my number one language. Earlier, earlier I used PHP and Python for many of those tasks. But nowadays, it's, it's mostly JavaScript, for sure, and, and C for microcontroller programming. Yep. So maybe I'm not the, <laughs> the best uh, guy to answer these questions, because I, I just had to learn way too many stuff lately, and, and I, I, I had a lot of things on my brain, and I, I, I have to focus the one language. Gotcha. Well, when it comes to, um, I, I guess, some history, what was, you know, you mentioned the Commodore 64 and you mentioned the PC. Um, can you remember some of the very first substantial things you've done that were like, that played a pivotal role into either you building the UHK keyboard? Like, what was it that uh, was pivotal earlier in your life that that is a, you know, a fun story that you can tell that's a, about how you got to where you're at today. Wow. Uh, could be an influencer, could be, you know, a particular project, maybe some client work. What was it that got you, you know, prepared to be the person behind this awesome keyboard? It's so hard to, to uh, pick a single experience. <laughs> tell, tell many. Yeah, so... For example, I was working on an e-government system for for a client, and for that I use I use PHP and uh, uh, Ajaxified, so to speak, uh, a major UI component. Uh, that was a filter table, and then I was working on a on a startup as a co-founder. It it was uh, called uh, Wonder, and the so it worked like you logged in to it was a web. To that O site, if I can use that term, because yes. it's heard Web term. Yeah. yeah. So the way it worked, you logged in and you you searched for songs, and you you added this the song of your choice to your to to your uh, playing uh, to your wish list, and then the system was listening to about 100 radio stations, and as soon as uh, on one of those stations it encountered with with your with a song on your playlist it recorded it uh, and so you could play it back or download it in your browser hmm. so so this was a pretty cool and fancy web application gotcha and as I understand it uh, kind of fast forwarding a little bit closer to today in preparation for all this happening and I guess to tee up Prior to the break, we got about a three or four minutes before the next break. Mm -hmm. But just to tee up the next conversation and maybe prime it a little bit. Um, the UHK, the ultimate hacking keyboard, um, has a, has not a Kickstarter. It's, uh, it's something different that I haven't personally heard of until I went to this one, which is Crowd Supply. So if you go to crowdsupply.com, it's a similar to Kickstarter. I don't know. what. Why did you choose Crowd Supply over something else to... to in quotes, kickstart this thing. Yeah, so the two major uh, crowd uh, funding sites are uh, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And about two years ago, we were contacted by uh, Indiegogo and Crowd Supply independently. And uh, initially, I was hesitant to choose one over the other, but I, I guess Crowd Supply better appeals to the gigi type if you if you take a look at their campaigns there are uh, many de developer related projects like uh, hardware projects and uh, developer boards and uh, i think they they these products appeal to the to our type to our kind and they not only uh, do the crowdfunding stage but th they can also help you in in PR and, and in uh, contacting manufacturers. And uh, yep, they, they do all this extra 
So crowd supply is a little different than Kickstarter. I didn't. I never really looked into the details. Like I almost imagine that uh, you, you're in charge of your own Kickstarter. It's essentially a platform for bringing, um, you know, the interests of the masses. But it's up to you to build out your page, do a video, source materials. So this seems exactly. like it's a little bit more. Uh, here in America, we have a show that you probably watch yourself. Uh, it's called Shark Tank, and it almost reminds me a little bit of that, where if you work with a shark, which is what they're called in the show, then they bring their own attributes to help you get to your goal. So not only do they bring, you know, buying into equity with funding or whatever, they'll bring in licensing partners, they'll bring in retail manufacturers, they'll bring in distribution, op- you know, operators mm-hmm. they've been working with for years. So is this similar with uh, with Crowd Supply, where... You know, not only are you hosting your uh, your your fundraising campaign on there, but they're also helping you in other ways too. Yep, they are able to if you ask them. Okay. So, yep, absolutely. Does that mean they and take a bigger piece of the pie, or does that mean that's just uh, an a la carte feature that you could just use if you want to or don't? Well, I'm not uh, actually sure what's what's the deal is uh, regarding regarding the. The extra services like uh, contacting manufacturers, because in all honesty, we didn't use that feature because we we built up uh, the connections with manufacturers. You already had your so, own contacts yeah. then. Yep, yep. Good. Yeah, but it's, it's pretty interesting uh, about crowdfunding that many people think that uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo is a way better platform because they are a better known. And the, the truth is that really you had to bring the people to the site. So prior to, to launching our campaign, we were proactively working on on developing this, this subscriber base, collecting the, all these people via our site. So and, and, the, and if you don't do that, then then you you won't be able to make your campaign a success. I'm glad you mentioned campaign because that was next on my list before we go into this break is is there's a campaign, as you can guess, on Crowd Supply because that's what we've been talking about here. Um, the campaign's name is Ultimate Hacking Keyboards. So if you're going there and searching, feel free to. But we're going to put the link to the campaign show page in our show notes. And, and right now, before we go into the break, you are, you are 104% funded, which means you don't really need the help of this show, which the funding ends this Sunday. Uh, so we're recording this on December 9th, uh, around mid-afternoon, here in U.S. Central Standard, Central Standard Time. And we'll have it edited and live on Friday morning. So if you're listening to this, it's either Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, or later, obviously. But if you're listening to this now, and now for you is December 11th, December 12th, or December 13th. Uh, if this is an interesting topic to you, you can go to the URL we'll have in our show notes and you know commit some support to this project at whatever level and we'll talk more detail about those levels so um i always find it interesting to to have these kinds of conversations on this show because it's it's sort of it's sort of two parts and in some ways if jared was on the show today which he's not he had some things going on by the way uh so that's why it's just me on the show but in some ways we don't really want to be the show where we have funding things on this show because we kind of feel spammy in a way but there's so much open source you're doing behind this and it's such a core component to being a hacker to have the ultimate hacking keyboard it only made sense to have this conversation so this is the last time i'm going to really press the issue of going there and checking it out and if you want to fund it then you can so as i said today we're recording it on the 9th uh the the campaign ends on the 13th which is december 13th so if you're listening to this between the 11th, 12th, or 13th, you still have time after that. Uh, maybe before the closing break, you can tell the listeners, if they're listening to it on the 14th, 15th, 16th, or beyond, what can they do after the funding is over to, to kind of hop in and take part and support this? Yes, yeah, so uh, via crowd supply, we will take pre-orders. So right now, a keyboard costs uh, $200. And uh, beginning from the... Uh, from the 15th, uh, it will cost 220 a little bit more expensive, but still cheaper than after the shipping, gotcha. which will happen on the July of the next year. 
Gotcha. And then also to to mention um, on that note, if people are going there now to, to support it, um, you're shipping potentially what mid to end of 2016. So it's it's the end of 2015 now. So it's almost a year turnaround until someone might have this in their hands. Is that is that roughly your estimate? Well, uh, it will happen in July. Okay. Shipping. Yep. So July 2016 is when shipping kicks off. Exactly. Yep. Good. Well, all right, Lotsy, that takes us into our first break. So let's let's take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to dive a lot deeper into the UHK, what it is, the software behind it, what it takes to actually make hardware and software meld together. Uh, this has been a labor of love for Lotsy, so I'm sure we got lots to cover. But for now, let's, let's break real quick here from a sponsor, and we'll be right back. TopTal is by far the best place to work as a freelance software developer right here on today's show. Lotsy and I talked about his experience at TopTal and how he's enjoyed being a part of a global network of engineers and the impact that has had on the ultimate hacking keyboard. If you're freelancing right now as a software developer and you're looking for a way to work with top clients on projects that are interesting to you, challenging, and using technologies you want to use, TopTal might just be the place for you. Also, a new perk to mention is being able to apply for a grant to work on open source of your choice so you can take a break from client engagements and give back to open source with the financial help of TopTal. Now, if you want a personal introduction, reach out to me, adam at changelog.com, and I will gladly put you in touch with the right people at TopTal. Otherwise, head to toptal.com slash developers to learn more and tell them the changelog sent you. All right, we're back with uh, Lotzi. So, you know, Lotzi, I'm just so excited about the conversation coming up because we're diving deep into the ultimate hacking keyboard. And now I'm going to preface this next two parts of the show with the fact that I've personally never thought about using something like this. Now, I'm primarily a front-end guy, designer, user experience, fluent in SAS, HTML, JavaScript, those kinds of things, but more on front-end web development. So I'd never really thought about personally using one of these. And I know Jared uses uh, a similar keyboard. It's more for ergonomics, not for re key mapping and like totally hacking this keyboard. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious if, um, if you can share where this idea came from for you. Like what made you think, man, I need to make a keyboard that's totally for hackers. Yeah, so it was back in the August of uh, 2007 and I noticed uh, moving my hands between the various blocks of the keyboard. Like there is the alphanumeric uh, block and there, there are the F keys and the na navigation block and the uh, new numpad. And I thought that it would be great if I could stay on the home row and, and never leave it. And of course it's, it's possible with various editors like for like uh, in VI, but you 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 are you aren't always in VI, and I wanted to uh, stay on the home row in a universal manner in every application. Right. So that was a major design principle. The the other thing was uh, I wanted it to be a split keyboard because I noticed my hand in this in this rather uncomfortable posture uh, close to each other. And I thought that it would be great if I could just separate the keyboard halves and position and orient them in any way I want. And uh, I also wanted to make it in a way that the two halves can be attached as one. And so it, it's super compact for right. transportation purposes. So uh, I came up with this idea and became super excited about it and uh, created a, I, I'm a Linux user and I created an X mode map keyboard, which is basically, there are these files, uh, these X mode map uh, files that you can write and, and it, they contain various key, keyboard mappings. And I configured my software mapping in a way that I, uh, I pressed the Windows key along with JKLI and it mapped to left, right, up, down. So I created the navigation uh, block uh, in 
the JKLI case. And I mapped uh, other, other keys like page up, page down, home, and to that region. And this way, I didn't have to move my hand, only my fingers. But uh, it wasn't ideal because for switching between these layers, uh, that is reaching, reaching the navigation function via, via the Windows key, it wasn't really comfortable. And I was thinking how to, to make it more comfortable. And I realized that if space is split, then one, one uh, part of it, one side of it can be used as space and the other can be used as a layer switch or key, so to speak. So uh, on the UHK, the right space is the space actually, and the left space is the MUD key. And if you keep uh, MUD, this is a layer switcher key. If you keep it pressed, then, then JKLI will, will trigger uh, left, down, right, up, and uh, way uh, H becomes page up and page down, and seven becomes F7. So you basically uh, map every key outside of the F numeric block to the F numeric block with the mod layer. To paint the picture, we mentioned that it breaks apart. So at the middle of the keyboard, I'm not sure which exactly, I got a picture up here. Let me go, go to it real quick so I can reference this. But basically, if you're looking at your typical keyboard, uh, from the number row down to the space bar row, you got six, T, G, B, and what is normally a space bar, which is actually split between a mod key and a space key on either side, that's where the keyboard splits. And that's on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you got, uh, again, from the number row down to the space row, you got 7, Y, H, N, and what's typically the space bar, that's on the right-hand side. So at that, at that point in the keyboard, if you're looking at your own keyboard right now, that's where you can see the split that, uh, that Lazzi is talking about. And so I just wanted to paint that picture real quick because you're describing it to to kind of paint that picture for the listeners, because this is not a visual. Sure. Okay. So uh, the keyboard is split according to touch typing rules. So if you do correct touch typing, then then it should be comfortable right. and not reach over to the other keyboard half. Which means the J key and the F key has got that little knobby that you can kind of feel with your pointer finger. Yep. yep. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And uh, the, the, the sixth key is always a subject of debate because in the US, uh, US people are trained to press the six key with their uh, right hand, but for, for various parts of the world, for example, in Hungary, we are trained to press it with the left uh, hmm. finger, left I, hand. I guess so. I really thought about what, key, what uh, hand I used to press the six key. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess maybe yeah, I just did a little test here as I was listening to you. I'm thinking I'm, I I would probably go with either. I don't know. I guess it depends on how my brain feels. I never really thought that there's a, a particular mm -hmm. pattern that's already existing there. So so the reason the the six key is is on the left half is because of symmetry because the keyboard is more symmetrical this way. Right. So this is the reason. So there is the base layer that features uh, H, J, K, L, K, L, and the other keys. And there is the mod layer. If you keep the mod key pressed, then, then this becomes left, uh, down, uh, right, and all the other navigation keys. And there is the mouse key that is in the place of caps lock. And if you keep it pressed, then J, K, L, I uh, will move the mouse pointer. And uh, this works without installing any special drivers because the keyboard exposes standard USB descriptors towards the, the host. And then there is the, the FN layer. You are all familiar with the FN key and it has various MIDI shortcuts like volume up, volume down and all these kinds of stuff. So there are these four layers that uh, makes you access all the functionality of the standard keyboard and more. I, would, I do want to dive into that because it's there's four layers and even the mouse that you'll probably dive into as well. Like even the mouse you can tap into and kind of remap. We have some questions specifically around that. Um, and I also noticed as you're describing it. Um, so for the listeners out there, if uh, we'll put some links in the show notes that you can kind of 
watch along because this is not a video podcast. It's a audio podcast, as you can tell. You've been listening for years. But nonetheless, we'll, we'll put some show notes in there for links out to images. And if you're following along, uh, let's see, the, on the left-hand side, when we talk about the brick of the keyboard, we have a mod key and a space key. So typically where the space key is, on the left-hand side, there's a mod key. And beneath that is this extra, which which is typically like this outer boundary of the of the keyboard that's not used, which is a space key. And on the yep. right-hand side, you have the space key and then the mod key, which is alternated. Why... Why did why what's with the alternation there? Is it uh, that you can kind of set? I don't know because because this can be, be completely remapped. It could be your own keyboard. No keyboard is the same. You can move your settings around as you want to, which we'll talk about. I'm sure, but it seems like you know why would you have the the mod key and the space key be alternated on on either side? Okay, so the guiding principle is that uh, every modifier key should be featured. Uh, both on the left and the right side, mm-hmm. because uh, in order to access various shortcuts, it's, it's just uh, comfortable. So just this way, the mod and space is accessible by both hands, but in a diagonal manner, because if you, if you use the UHK for a week, then you will wire your brain uh, to use this layout for right. your own layout, if you if you so choose, and most of the time you you won't have to use the case buttons that you you mentioned, and the case buttons exist because simply because it's easy; they are e- easy to reach uh, by by our thumbs. So there is a large amount of space there, and this way you could make the layout symmetrical. I mean feature the modifiers on both sides. Gotcha. Uh, We got a little ahead of ourselves. I wanted to dive uh, that deep a little bit later on, but that's okay. What I'm looking for at this point is, uh, is to, to kind of escalate this conversation over, over the next 20 or so or 30 or so minutes is to figure out what was going on in your brain, in your mind, in your, day-to-day life as a software developer, what made you be like, man, this, you know, because there's mechanical keyboards out there, you know, there's ergonomic keyboards out there. Why did you not like what was currently available on the market, whether it's open source, not open source, crowdfunded or not? What problems were you hitting as a software developer that was like, I've got to make this UHK, even if it was back in 2007, which is, you know, almost eight years now, more than a little over eight years now, since this problem has been existing for you, what, what were you hitting? What happened to make you think I need to build something that's much better for developers? So two key uh, words are productivity and ergonomy. So if, if you, if I don't have to move my, my hands, it's uh, in my mind, this is great because really all, all this started from, for me moving my hands across the, the various blocks and, it's if you if you use a dedicated mouse, uh, it's also much easier to access it this way because there is a the distance is shorter between the keyboard and and the mouse because there is no uh, navigation block and uh, numpad. And the other thing, the ergonomic ergonomy is it just it's so much more comfortable to, to orient the keyboard halves. Mm-hmm. You, you can even you can even use it in shoulder width. This whole this whole design, this compact, truly split design that merges as one and reconfigurable. This whole concept, these features, just made sense as a software developer. Not moving my hand, hands, holding my finger, being able to reposition my the keyboard halves. Gotcha. So obviously, ergonomic keyboard made sense. Even mechanical keyboards made sense, but the the lacking of the remapping, the lacking of the open source underlying software, whether it's a CAD drawing, whether it's the uh, the JavaScript agent, various things we'll talk about. These things were something that you wanted to bring to fruition. Mm-hmm. So, what what were the the? <laughs> I guess I didn't understand fully your question. Could you please? Well, it wasn't really a question. It was more like a statement, uh, priming you to to chime in, like. So you've got open source obviously involved here. 
uh, and as I understand it, it's the the so the the firmware, the electronics design files. So I'm assuming there's some sort of CAD pieces in there that you're actually you know open sourcing on GitHub. You got the agent, and these are all coming mm-hmm. under the GPL license. So you know to yep. to kind of take a step back, you've got ergonomic keyboards which have been there. You know whether they break apart or not. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you've got mechanical keyboards, whether they break apart or not. There's various different types. And uh, truth be told, behind the scenes in the Changelog members room, we've had several conversations about, um, you know, mechanical keyboards and how they change your life. And as I said, too, you know, to preface my scenario, I'm not the kind of person I don't think that needs this. Although I think I can appreciate it because there are a lot of people I know that would love, love, love to make their keyboard their own and to never leave the home row as you've described and to never do the things that you're describing, which is to have to touch a mouse. And so I'm, I'm just uh, wondering behind the scenes, you know, what the motivations were not just to solve a problem, but also to put some power back into the community, which is through open source, through open source diagrams and those kinds of things. Gotcha. Yeah. So I, I, I've been using Linux for uh, the year 2000 and uh, it, it just makes sense for me as a developer to to open up the product to to make it super customizable right because i've been in situations when uh i've had a router and i i uh, wanted to use a third party uh dynamic dns provider and i couldn't because that router uh, offered me about three options and my preferred options wasn't amongst those. So, and, and it's, it seemed really trivial to be able to specify a URL to be pinged, but it, it couldn't do it. And or I'm, or I'm, my sister purchased a DVD player and uh, uh, put in a, a disc, and then the sub- subtitle fonts were were very small, and there wasn't a way to enlarge them. Which is ridiculous because right. if if the software was open source, that that would have been so much easy to implement. So all, I, I encountered with all, all these limitations, and we are surrounded by these devices uh, containing general purpose uh, processors. Yeah, and we are unable to to exploit their full potential because because the whole thing is a black box, and I, I hate it. <laughs> So what what I hear you saying is that whether it's a DVD player, whether it's whatever out there, there's a general purpose software that's available that makes literally no sense to have as, you know, in quotes, proprietary. Like maybe the company is not trying to hide it or keep it or close the source purposefully. But it sounds like what I'm what I'm hearing from you is that that really irked you and to be able to build something that was physical, you know, actual hardware object that has software tie-ins and to make that software open source so that those who want to tinker, like you've said you wanted to in your past, were able to, were free to do so. And obviously in the end, uh, you know, on the on your GitHub repos, you do have the ability to veto or not veto pull requests. So that doesn't mean that every single pull request has to be committed back to master, but that means that the power of the people is available. And that sounds like that's a motivating factor for you. Yeah, yeah, number of, I think, empowering people. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly what the change log is all about. This show, why Jared and I do this, is because we exist to enrich the lives of developers, and there is no better way that we can think of right now in today's age other than through great community and open source software development. So that's that's what I love to hear about because, you know, part of this show is going deep and technical, and part of this show is... Is dis- is discovering the whys, the the mysteries of why Lotzi and his team would say we need to rebuild this hardware thing and make all of it open source, you know. And I want the listeners to understand where you're coming from because you've been through some sort of, you know, some some sort of past that got you to where you're at now, and that's important. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right, so it's uh, it is time for another break. I'm gonna. I'm going to fast forward the time by three minutes. So if you're listening to this and you think, man, this break is coming just a a hair too soon. It is. It's coming exactly two minutes and 56 seconds too soon. Because when I come back, diving deeper into this 
uh, topic with Lotsy. I want to go even more deeper to all the tech behind it, how things mapped out, and uh, that, that's a pun on purpose. So <laughs> we'll hear we'll hear more when we get back. So not for another break. We're right back. If you thought Harvest was only about time tracking, check again. Fast invoicing and payments. You can easily create and send invoices and accept payments with PayPal, Stripe, and many more. You got expense tracking without the mess. You got an iPhone or an Android app to go on the go with you. Snap those receipts and store them in the Harvest app. You can also connect favorite tools like Slack and use chat commands to start and stop your timers. Head to getharvest.com and start your free trial. And once that trial is over, use our code CHANGELAW to save 50% off your first month. Everyone, we're back with Lotso. We are, we're diving deep. You know, I said Lotso. You know why I said Lotso? Because <laughs> I was thinking about Toy Story. Anybody out there listening to this show thinking about to- Toy Story when I say Lotsy? Because uh, one of the characters in the most recent, uh, I can't believe I'm going on this tangent, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just run with it. Because Lotso was the, uh, he was an, the antagonist of Toy Story 3. And so when I said Lotsy, it kind of reminded me of Lotso, nonetheless. Um, we're, we're back nonetheless with, uh, with Lotsy and we're diving deep, it, even deeper into this ultimate hacking keyboard. And maybe the best part to start with this segment is, uh, is the open source behind it. We've got everything from CAD drawings to JavaScript user agents, firmware, bootloaders. Where do we begin with talking about the open source out there that powers this hardware device? Okay, so everything is open source except uh, for the CAD, which we will release in a delayed fashion uh, five years later. That is the only way uh, that uh, we gain some leverage. Oh, but all the other, all the other components, that is the electronics, the firmware, and the host side software are already open source and uploaded to GitHub. So when I'm on your mm-hmm. When I'm on your profile, which if you want to follow along, listeners, you can go to github.com slash ultimate hacking keyboard, and you'll see some repos there. The first one that might come to to notice uh, for me is agent, then electronics, then firmware, and then bootloader left, and then ultimately bootloader right. And the languages yep. GitHub chose to, to label these, tell me if they're wrong or not. So agent is JavaScript, electronics is CAD, which is why I said CAD. I thought, I thought that meant mm-hmm. actually CAD drawings. And then the firmware is obviously written in C, um, mm-hmm. and then bootloader left is processing, and then bootloader right is <laughs> C. Are those accurate labels that GitHub mess up? Yeah, actually, bootloader left is C, just like bootloader right. But uh, say, other than just, that, it's it's correct. We just saw a processing lab. You know, we just we just uh, covered processing recently in an issue of Changelog Weekly, and I didn't think it was C like. It's, it's different. It's it's more well, something else. The, the Arduino platform uses a processing API that is implemented on top of C. Okay. So in a way, it's, uh, it's C, but a special API. I see. Okay. So let's start with Agent then, if we can. So Agent is the configuration application used for the UHK. What, what is this? This is your native language you love, JavaScript. So it's your preferred. Mm-hmm. What is this? Yep. What does it do for the keyboard? What, well, the, there is a difference between what does it do and what will it do, because <laughs> Agent is, is in a pretty early stage at this point. It's a, right now, it's a command line application, uh, which enables you to uh, in, configure and enumerate the UHK and do some operations. But really, uh, ultimately, this, this will be a GUI configuration applications uh, executed on top of Node WebKit, that is, I think the the project has been renamed to NWJS. I mean, Node WebKit. Right. So this is a runtime. This is basically uh, Chromium and Node.js fused together, so you can uh, develop native applications uh, on top of web technologies and Node APIs. So Node uh, Node WebKit a.k.a. nw.js. Um, that agent runs on Windows. It runs on OS X. It also runs on Linux platforms. Can you tell us more about that project and how you're using it? 
Sure. So right now, agent is a command line application. I can use it to re-enumerate uh, the keyboard. So normally it's enumerated in keyboard mode, but <clears throat> it can also be uh, enumerated in as the left and the right bootloader if, uh, if I want to upgrade the firmware, firmware of the keyboard via USB. And I can, I can also uh, manipulate and query the EEPRO e e memory of the keyboard. So right now it's, it's rather low level and command line, but by building on this low level functionality, it, it, it will end up being a, an Angular uh, application, Angular JS based GUI application in which uh, you will be able to individually configure the keys and the layers and key maps of the keyboard and and all kinds of functionality the the speed of the mouse movement and its acceleration and the various add-on modules and so this will be a full full blown configuration application gotcha and you mentioned mouse and i gotta mention uh, i gotta imagine that anybody listening is thinking like now i have a keyboard with four different layers of techno of, of of different functionality that I can totally program, including the mouse. Can we talk about the accuracy of the mouse whatsoever? How does the mouse function work? Is it enough to do? I mean, is it painful to use? Obviously, you're not going to say no, but, you know, <laughs> it, how accurate is it? Will people really enjoy using the mouse feature of this keyboard? Yeah, so uh, for what it is, it's surprisingly useful. I uh, implemented inertia. So when you start to move your pointer, it... It doesn't start with full speed, but uh, slowly increments. So it's 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 pretty useful. But of course, uh, such a keyboard-based solution can't replace a dedicated mouse, and uh, this is the reason why we came up with uh, add-on modules. So if you split the keyboard, you will, you will be able to to mount additional physical hardware modules to the main keyboard such as uh, a key cluster on the left uh, hand and a, or, or a, a trackball, a trackpad and the and track point. Right. Yep. So you can, you can choose of these modules and uh, mount uh, whichever you like. And this is the extension of the original concept of never leaving the home row. And there is a large area uh, that are uh, thumbs cover and you can easily easily reach dedicated point or devices this way. So these modules are obviously pretty interesting. And anybody listening right now is thinking like, okay, so I can, I can layer on these modules. Are they optional? Are there future ones plans? Like, are there some that you've already kind of pre-configured that are available? And then obviously since this, this is the ultimate hacking keyboard, you can obviously make your own. Or at least I'm assuming, yep. you know, are they optional? Are there future ones planned? What are available right now? Yeah, they are completely optional. You can use, use the UHK without any modules. And if uh, some of uh, the modules are, you think you, will, you would be use them, then you can just purchase them separately, and use them as you like, to replace them. Okay. So some, it, you know, you said the word purchase there, which may have gotten some people like, whoa, hang on, I bought, I bought this keyboard. Now there's more to buy. I feel like there's like an in-app purchases, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> can you talk about the ecosystem from a revenue generation point uh, mm -hmm. to the hacking point? Because obviously hackers love to make their own things and use freely, uh, not meaning don't pay the person who made it because we obviously want to support you making this thing in the first place to make your business sustainable to keep doing this thing. But, um, you know, what are, the, what are the plans for modules? Is there going to be a module ecosystem people can go to and purchase things? You know, describe that uh, as, as you might like to. Sure. So the we will open up the protocol uh, via which the modules communicate with the keyboard itself. And uh, third party developers will be able to uh, develop their own modules. And we will also sell a developer kit and publish the, the CAD uh, data of the modules. So anybody will be able to 3D print uh, their own modules and create whatever crazy inputs 
device that they want to make. Uh, we could even use joysticks or, well, th there are a lot of possibilities there using any kind of pointer devices. So what I thought of as modules and you thought of modules are seem to be similar, but different. So you just talked about a joystick. It sounds like we're breaking out of just the UHK into actually allowing developers to have open source that you're providing to build their own modules. And then you're using that same open source to build your own modules, which you'll be able to sell. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, how how did you mean this exactly? Well, what I mean by that is that you've got some open source out there that, that allows somebody to build their own own module so they can 3D print their own thing if they wanted to. So if they wanted to yep. hack away and, and build something like a numeric key, you know, or just a, a keypad that sits there only. They can do that if they wanted to. Is that yeah. what I heard? Yep, they could do that, but uh, because of the mechanical constraints, so the whole thing is designed that... Uh, the keyboard halves are interconnected by uh, these precision machined uh, steel guides. And these same steel guides are used for modules. Gotcha. So okay. when, you, when you separate the two halves, uh, these, these same guides are used to, to mount the, the modules themselves. So this way, the add modules are mechanically constrained to, to be located there. Uh, between the two keyboard halves, essentially. And uh, there are pogo pins that, that, uh, for the electricity and data. So there's some hardware that they might need to buy from you that they can build upon, basically. Yep. Okay, yep. That, that totally makes sense. So once you break this keyboard apart again, once we went back to the earlier analogy, 6TGB down to the space bar is the left-hand side when you break it apart, and 7YHN, if I remember correctly myself, that's the right-hand side. And in between those yep. two, once you break it apart, um, hackers out there that are working with the UHK could essentially buy some hardware for themselves to put in between these two pieces or attach to the two pieces once they're broken apart and use open source that you've already provided to build mm -hmm. upon it, fork it, make their own things, and potentially even 3D print their own actual stuff and connect back to it yep that that really does complete the whole entire cycle of being the ultimate hacking i mean so <laughs> when you said ultimate hacking you really really meant it didn't you yeah we, we really, really want to push this uh as much uh as much as possible to to cram as as much functionality to the hardware as, as possible so we camped out a bit on the agent. Let's talk a bit about firmware. Cause I remember in our, we got emailed from you, let's say about a month ago. And uh, we've, we've had some things going on in between now and then that uh, didn't allow this call to take place until roughly three days before your, your funding end. But nonetheless, you mentioned that once funding was reached, you would open source several things. And one of those things was the firmware electronics, uh, the agent we've just been talking about here. Can you talk a bit about the electronics piece that's, uh, there's an electronics pr uh, project on GitHub on your mm -hmm. profile there, and there's also a firmware. Can you talk about those two pieces there? Sure. Uh, so the electronics rep repo contains the KiCad files. KiCad is, a, is an electronics design program. So if you download and install KiCad, uh, then you can open these files and you can see the the printed circuit board, and you can manipulate it. You can even send to a fab and get it made. So it's, it really enables you to, to extend the UHK, add uh, LEDs, backlighting, for example, or all kinds of crazy stuff. So when you talk about KiCad, you're talking about uh, the same, if, I've, if my uh, Google Foo is correct, if you go to KiCad-PCB.org, which is KiCad EDA, a cross-platform and open source electronic design automation suite, is that the same thing you're leveraging? You're building upon somebody else's shoulders here? Yep, it's, just, it's the project that we are talking about. Yep, gotcha. It's the KiCad PCB. I know the hardware hackers are there like, Adam, get with it. You know, this is out there already. But you know what? Open source moves fast, so we just try to keep up. <laughs> So, okay, so this is this is some more open source already out there, available developers, and you're just building on the shoulders of more giants. 
Yep. Originally, we, we used the Eagle, which is a, another a popular choice in the electronics design, open source electronic design community, but right. that uh, isn't an open source uh, software and you are limited uh, by, to, to design very small boards with the free version. So eventually I migrated to KiCad because it is totally free, unlike Eagle. And uh, this way we can enable more people to to hack the keyboard. Right. So the electronics repo is is a KiCad project, building upon the uh, KiCad ADA cross platform open source uh, software we just talked about there. So it's yep. your so your open source is leveraging uh, specs, platforms, software already out there from someone else that's desiring the same thing you are, which is hey, I have some hardware I want to be able to manipulate and give back to as a developer, um, whether super hacker or not, back to open source. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the idea. Fantastic. All right, let's 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 move to the next one then. So the next one is the firmware. What's what's going on in the firmware? Is there a, to, to what can a developer do inside the firmware that, that uh, is notable? Okay, so the, the way it works is that the, the left keyboard half sends key press and key release events to the right keyboard halves. Then the right keyboard half maintains a matrix of keys and the, the, key, the state of the keys. And based uh, on this state, it, it decides which layer is the active one and it uh, it sends out the relevant scan codes via a USB uh, to the host computer. And uh, it's, it's more versatile than, than most keyboard, keyboards because it uh, ex exposes three different USB interfaces. So there is the keyboard interface, of course. Right. And there, is the, there is the mouse interface to implement the, the mouse functionality. And there is a third a generic HID interface for communication purposes. So when you use agent to configure the UHK, this third interface is used as a transport. So, uh, and there is a there is a library that is used for the firmware of the right keyboard half that is called Lufa, which stands for lightweight USB library for AVRs. Uh, the, the microcontrollers are AVR processors and this is pretty much the most popular library to interface with uh, USB capable AVR microcontrollers because uh, USB is a very complex protocol. If you think about it, uh, there are pen drives and uh, Bluetooth modems and printers and all kinds of devices that is USB, a single protocol. So this is a heavily layered, super complex protocol. And I personally couldn't write from the ground up a USB stack, USB library. And uh, luckily this is available and open source and we, we built up on this library. Very interesting. So you got the left side and the right side. Can you talk a bit more about, uh, I could imagine those listening to that piece there was thinking like, okay, the left side communicates to the right. The right, as we mentioned earlier in the show, has alternate modifier keys. The space key typically is alternated on the left and the right. So the left-hand side is, is um, let me go back to my screenshot to make sure I'm speaking correctly. So the left side, the key uh, that is typically your space bar is the mod key. And then when you break it apart, the right side, which is typically your space bar, is, you guessed it, the space bar. And so those two alternate whenever you break them apart. Can you talk a bit about this conversation that happens between software and between the hardware that uh, that hackers would enjoy when they when they really make this thing their own mm -hmm. between the left and the right? Mm -hmm. So it all starts with the keyboard matrix. So the keys are arranged into matrix of rows and columns, and this matrix is scanned about a thousand times per second. And so the software can maintain a state of these keys. So the, the, the state of the keys are stored in this matrix in, in the RAM of the microcontroller. 
And like I said, the left keyboard half uh, sends, sends over the keyboard, uh, the key press and key really sends to the right keyboard half. And, and then we end up with, with a matrix of keys. And then in the next phase, the firmware checks for the layer switcher keys like MAD or mouse or and FN. And based on those keys, it, uh, it, it sees which layer is the active one. And, and then, accord, uh, based on that layer, it, uh, it constructs uh, a USB report containing the, the scan codes that are related to those keys on the actual layer on the actual key map. Uh, did that make sense? <laughs> it totally... I mean, it makes sense as much as it makes sense. Okay. Without seeing it, touching it visually as we have this conversation, it's it's a little foreign, but I'm mm -hmm. following. And and I guess what I'm trying to gather at this point is is thinking like, you know, going back to the name, the ultimate hacking keyboard. I know some people that just are, I, I don't want to call them true hackers because it, it sort of mislabels the word hacker, period. But they're just people mm -hmm. who love like you had mentioned earlier, to tinker, to go beyond yep. the status quo of like making something their own. And I feel like what you've done here with creating the hardware and the software is what maybe not where it's at right today. And maybe you can help back me up on this, but I'm going to hypothesize that the future of this thing is that if you're someone who loves to tinker with their keyboard, loves to make what they do their own. You love the fact that you can break apart a keyboard and do all sorts of stuff and maybe even borrow some of your polyglot attributes. They can dive deep into this thing, make it their own. And above all else, what we haven't even talked about is take it anywhere. You know, like mm -hmm. that's what I love most about what I think this conversation is about is like this hardware piece that came out of like several years of love from you mm -hmm. and a, a passion for, when you when you touch a hardware object that has software components, not being able to change those, but making what has come from it open source so that those who use it can and even add to it and enrich the ecosystem. So if I'm understanding you correctly, like this thing sounds to me like a hacker's dream. And going back to the original blog post on uh, on Trello, how I built the developers dream keyboard seems to me like it's really going to be playing true. Yeah. Originally I gave a more modest <laughs> title to that uh, article. Yeah. And uh, uh, the top tag guys made it a little fancier, but uh, yeah. Wow. Thanks for saying that. Well, you know, going back to our friends at top Tau, those guys <laughs> are committed to excellence and for outside sure. the, yep. the sponsors that you've, the sponsor note you mentioned that I've mentioned during this show. We love those guys. We love working with top top because they are so committed to enriching developers lives. And may, you know, I think that post with you and then, you know, how they helped you with it. And then where you're at today is, is completely evident. So if you've been on the fence about what top top is, uh, go back and listen to our sponsor mentions. We love them. We think you'll love them too. We totally trust them. Um, but moving on to some some future topics here, we gotta go to a break real quick. We're gonna come back and we're gonna talk uh, a, a little bit about uh, not so much the UHK, but uh, who you are, I guess. Again, as a as a software developer, maybe some of your heroes, something that's um, super secret that no one knows about, you can share. But uh, we're gonna take a break. We'll come back and we'll talk about that. Our friends at Linode are huge fans of the show and they're excited to support what we're doing here at the Changelog. And they want to invite every single listener of the Changelog to try out one of the fastest, most efficient SSD cloud servers on the market. You can get a Linode cloud server up and running in seconds with your choice of Linux distro, resources, and also node location. And they've got eight data centers spread across the entire world, North America, Europe, Asia Pacific, and plans start at just $10 a month. They've got hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add-on services. Get full root access for more control, run VMs, run containers, or even your own private Git server. Enjoy native SSD storage, 40 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors on your servers. 
Use the code CHANGELOG10 with unlimited uses. Tell your friends it doesn't expire until December 31st, 2016. That's next year. Head to linode.com slash changelog to get started. And now back to the show. All right, we're back with Lotsi again. Uh, just so excited about what you've built here so far. And the open source component of it is obviously pivotal. So if you're out there and you're listening to this and you're thinking, this literally is, or I think it might be, the ultimate uh, hacking keyboard, it, it, a hacker keyboard. The open source component to me is is um, is unheard of. It's not there so far. We talked about the agent. We talked about the electronics, the the, the firmware, which also led to bootloader left and bootloader right. If I'm if I'm uh, clear on that, what else do you have planned? on the open source horizon around this hardware device that is going to get hackers excited today that they're going to make them either want to go support the project or do whatever it takes to get 200 bucks out of their pocket and give it to you for this thing. Yeah. So I, I think uh, the UHK uh, provides a unique set of features. I mean, there are other split keyboards, uh, on the market. Right, it's and, not a new thing. It's been done before. But yeah, sure. you're doing it differently. But yeah, for example, the, the add-on modules are one of a kind. I mean, nobody has ever done that before. Or the other unique feature is the stainless steel inserts uh, on the back of the, of the keyboard. So you can mount it, the two keyboard halves separately to the arms of your armchair. So this is another unique uh, think so you can sit but, essentially back into like a lazy boy so to speak here in america we have an, a lazy yeah. boy and you can put one on the right and one on the left and kick it all the way back totally in comfort in leather and hack yep <laughs> see that's the best man yeah and, and the, the way i see it this is a, a platform i mean uh, it, it has a hardware software architecture and based on this architecture, we plan to build other keyboards in the future. Like this is a 60% keyboard, which means that it only contains the alphanumeric block. We plan to build uh, an 80% version, which will contain the alphanumeric block plus the F keys plus the navigation block. And, okay. and, and then maybe other versions. But the way I see it, this is, really just, this is a nervous system. Uh, if you will, and you can arrange this, you can fit this nervous system into various shapes and forms, and it can be a basis of other split keyboards that uh, that have the same uh, great features and extensibility with add-ons and uh, all this fancy stuff. So even even hackers can can design keyboards of other shapes with this same core of hardware and and software and firmware components. You know, on that note too, I think we, you know, it just wouldn't do it justice if we didn't touch on it because it's clear as day when you go watch the video and I don't want to repeat everything that's out there already, although it should at least be touched on. And what I think is kind of interesting is that like, no matter what the program you work with, whether it's a game, whether it's an IDE, whether it's, you know, you name it, the four layers that you we talked about already, and even the mouse, all the application-specific key maps you can do, it's totally customizable. So if you're playing, um, you know, Fallout 4, for example, and you, and you want to configure it specifically to how you like to play that game, you can do it for that. And if it's, Ruby on Rails, or if it's in your case, JavaScript programming, and you've got some specific keys that that really help you be a better developer, then you can remap to that. I think that's really an interesting piece there is that just this, the ability to just make it your own, regardless of application device, you know, that you can just do that. And it's, it's easy. Yeah. yeah Hopefully, I'm is it, is it easy? It will be easy. Right now, you have to to modify a matrix, a C matrix. Right. But but later on, if the if the agent, the configurator application will be in a more advanced state, that will happen before shipping. 
then you will be able simply to click uh, in a GUI application and reconfigure the the keyboard, the, the key map. And for example, I, I'm a heavy user of convenience shortcuts. So Alt Tab, for example, is used by every one of us uh, many times a day. Yep. And and Alt Tab on the factory key map is mapped to the D key of the mod layer. So instead of reaching out for Alt Tab, I simply press mod D without leaving the home row. And this may not seem like a, like like a big deal, but when you use Alt Tab hundreds, if not thousands of right. times per day, it's it's a big deal. Really, yeah, probably. Over the years. Half a thousand for me. 500 times a day, I'm going to guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good estimate. Yep. So Jared couldn't make this show, but you know, it, it wouldn't be a show. It wouldn't be a changelog episode if we didn't even have a little bit of Jared in here. And there's been a couple sprinkles of it in here. Um, but uh, but he, he said before the modules are super interesting. They're totally optional. Uh, you mentioned some plan for the future of these modules. Um, how will you support those out there who are maybe making modules and don't have the ability to 3D print? What uh, what kind of support can you give back to the community that's that's uh, that's building upon this but don't have the ability to print? Well, we will offer developer kit kits for sale, and that way, do you mean the physical accessibility of? Uh, of creating an add-on? Yeah, well, I think there's the software side of it, which I think people can probably get to, mm -hmm. to the point on their own. But if they actually want to build something out of it and they don't have the ability, or let's say they build it and it's kind of like, eh, it's okay. Uh, and maybe it's something they want to pony up back to you and say, well, can you manufacture this and give it a, give it to everyone? You know, is it, it it's that cool? Yeah, we should be able to do that. Uh, maybe, maybe we should do uh, polls about it later on right. because if, if if there is only one person in the world who, who wants that module that it's, it's just simply not feasible right uh, to be manufactured but if there is a significant uh, community interest then then we should be able to do that we should do that in order to develop uh, a module you will have to have some hardware skills because well, so software is easier in this respect. You just have to download the IDE and stuff and, and start coding. But in order to develop a physical module, you have to have some gear like soldering iron and uh, stuff like that and some experience with, with electronics. I think it's pretty much necessary. Uh, we, we want to make this process as simple as possible for people. But but Harvard is just uh, harder. Uh, yeah, that's software. Well, it's yeah. it's you actually have to make something real, you know. Yep. You know, yep. Plastic, metal, whatever you whatever you know, whatever material you're working with, it, it's you know we get so used to this command Z, uh, you know, you know RF. Uh, RM, you know, to just remove or, you know, remove something from command line or something like that. Like, uh, we just get so used to that in the, in the real world, mm -hmm. well, things are real, you know? Yeah, but uh, more and more developers uh, seem to go into the hardware right. scene. And uh, they are, they purchase Arduinos and, and start tinkering with hardware. And once you get into it, you, you learn more and more, and uh, this becomes natural over time so it's, it's not rocket science but it, it it needs some practice for sure right and if you want to create a new modules module maybe you also have to order components from drives stores like joystick or what have you right i think it's interesting too going back to your note before about being a platform and uh Maybe I'm reading between the lines, you tell me, but being a platform to me sounds like you're not going anywhere, right? And <laughs> there's something that, there's a promise there, so to speak. So when you come on this show and you and you go out there and you create a, a, uh, a crowdfunding campaign 
and you actually make something real and you ship it to people and you open source software and you talk about it and you live it and you dream it. It sounds to me like you're making a promise. And especially when you said there's a platform here, like if there's someone, if there's someone listening to this show and they're thinking this may, this may not be for me. It sounds interesting. The software sounds interesting. The, the, the open source aspect of it sounds interesting. The hardware clearly is interesting. Um, we didn't even touch at all on, I mean, I guess to a degree we touched on, you know, the, 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 the makeup of it, how strong and sturdy it is. But when you make something like you have, and I haven't touched it, but I've talked to other people who have that I trust, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, egghead, egghead.io. I trust that guy, you know, mm-hmm. he touched it. Mm-hmm. He put it together. He pulled it apart. He put it back together. But what I, the point I'm trying to make here is that if, if you're doing that, then and you're saying this is a platform to me it sounds like to the developer world you're making a promise that you're going to be there for the future yep. whether it's in the open source whether it's in the hardware and that if you can dream it and you can build it sounds a little cliche but if you can do those things with this ultimate hacking keyboard then you're going to be there in one way or another to support it whether it's through some way to make money from it as other developers or one way to support their open source and help them become better software developers. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. You are spot on uh, by saying that it's a platform. I mean, most manufacturers create a single product, but we rather uh, think uh, about integrating uh, the the hardware, the firmware, the software, and cloud, and, and provide the how how should I say say it uh, more? Let's let's stop for a minute. Well, some sort some sort of support, some sort of support. If there's something that built from it, then you're going to be able to provide a way to, you know, almost uh, package manager it, you know, to a way. Like if you build it, people can find it. Yep, and and the the hardware and the software is is much better integrated than. Than on on other keyboards, which is a maybe a brave statement to make. <laughs> but yeah. but but when when you you open up the box, you will encounter with something that you have never seen right in other product. And I I don't want to uh, talk about this, but I I want to surprise people, so I <laughs> I rather won't. Talk well, about this. We have to leave some some uh, some cards up our sleeves, so to speak. Yep. You know, we can't reveal every single thing, but we can do what we can to get people excited about it. I, I have one more question on your open source piece, and it and as we talk through the agent, the firmware, and several other pieces, if someone's listening to this and they're going to those repos now, they seem a little, let's say, what better way to say it might be sparse, right? There's not a lot of uh, getting started. So clearly some documentation is lacking yep. here. And, and one final sure. closing question I have before we go into some of our closing questions is uh, for those who are trying to hack it or uh, reprogram it or do other things where uh, right now, it seems like the, the resources to do that are a little lacking. How soon uh, will those come online? Will those be in the, in the individual repos? Will they be at some of the, so with a place, will there be some screencasts about it? What can people expect to say like, hey, uh, Lotsy, you got you to hold my hand a little bit. Get me started. How can I get to the hello world of the UHK? Sure. So I plan to gr- gradually add documentation to the repos. I just uh, published them uh, yesterday. So I haven't had time to do that. This is fresh but, and open uh, source. This is fresh and new right here. Like, this is as fresh yeah. as it gets. Yeah, but uh, I agree that it's, it's super important to hold the hand of other people, and this will be done for right. sure. I, I really want this to to be easy, easy, easily digestible, easy to hack on. And maybe some grace back to you from the community is that you know maybe thirty seconds. Share share what you've been going through. Like you're just about to close out a hundred and four percent funded project on crowd supply you know so you you've got the necessary funding to do what you're promising to do 
Mm-hmm. Um, so you got a lot of pressure on you as a one man, maybe a two people show. I don't know who else you have involved with you. Yeah. And we didn't talk about that really, but you got a lot of pressure on you to deliver right now. And so you've got priorities uh, and may- maybe documentation and getting started in Hello Worlds are lower down, but not at the bottom. So uh, should I talk about the priorities? Yeah, sure. What What are the closing priorities on, on this? Like, so you, you're... On Sunday, it's clear it's going to be funded. So on Sunday, it may be just be even more overfunded. So, but right now, even before the end of the the funding, it is fully funded. So what's next? Sure. So now we should start to to create the molds of the plastic parts as soon as possible. So we should finalize the design very quickly because the mold making process will take about three or four months. So we have to kickstart it as soon as possible. So right now, this is the fifth generation prototype. We will iterate a little bit to make it easier to manufacture and then uh, contact the, with the company uh, who will create the molds. Okay. And, and then gradually uh, uh, create mode for the, for the add-on modules and in parallel develop the further develop the firmware and especially the agent. By the way, my partner Andres is a mechanical engineer and he is very hands-on with these the mechanical uh, mm, topics of the project. Right, right, right. Which is uh, very different from outsourcing everything to China and expect them to. <laughs> to to make everything perfectly because we could totally outsource right anything but then Andras would have to fly out a uh, dozen of times to China or Taiwan or live and there so, <laughs> for a or, bit or live there yeah yeah so there are huge hidden costs so i think it's it's just great that he's able to to hop into the car and drive for an hour and arrive to the company and directly see where where they are. Well, that's a lot easier than, than a plane flight than a half day trip or something like that. So, oh yeah, that's interesting too. Like, uh, yeah, I have to apologize for not uh, asking you who else is involved in this because you know I guess the sole okay. conversation people have been assuming it's just you, and it's mm-hmm. uh, it's not just you. It's it's counterparts that complement your existing software development skills to mm-hmm. make proper hardware and to do all the mechanical pieces and stuff like that. Yeah, if somebody takes a close look at the UHK, it, it will be apparent that a uh, mechanical engineer is heavily involved because ju- just, the, just the interconnection mechanism, these uh, precision machined stainless steel parts and, right. and all this mechanical solution, it is it's very robust and professionally designed. And Andras is a, Andras is a great uh, mechanical engineer and a perfect perfectionist so i fully trust him absolutely to to make this a great one, a great product well let's uh let's stop tailing off the call to some of our closing questions where which were just as more, just as much interesting as our previous conversations around the uhk the open source around it the the platform the promise the hardware all the ability to hack it to the hackers hearts content um but again, going back to who you are, um, maybe the first question we can start with is what's something that's super secret that's uh, not known by any, anybody else? It could be a personal attribute, could be an upcoming announcement, but what's something super secret that no one knows about you or what you're doing that you can share here today on the show as we close out? Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty much a perfectionist and uh, I take... Uh, code quality very seriously and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, I guess it's, it's challenging for me to I can work in a team but uh, I always strive to to write super clean code that is as simple as possible and even name the, the individual variable, variables and both on the high level and, and on the low level uh, create something that is it's very easier to understand and yeah, it's a personal challenge of, of mine, but I, I think it's, it serves the projects that I work on on the long term. 
So, yeah. So you're a perfectionist. Yeah. yeah. And you're asking for grace. <laughs> you know, on, on being a perfectionist. Yeah. To a degree. That makes sense. I mean, we all want to, you know, one of the biggest fears about doing something like you're doing, which is days away. And uh, people are listening to this and they're thinking, this thing is awesome. I want it. Or it's the worst idea ever. I hate it. You know, who knows what they're thinking. I'm guessing the former. And we, we have seen all these opinions <laughs> over the years. Right. So you, you've seen all the opinions. And what I'm thinking is that uh, as makers, right, as someone audacious enough to actually make something real, not not saying make an open source isn't real, but what I mean by that is like, is like the, we just went back to it, the promise that you're making, like to make this promise to deliver what you're doing takes a lot of courage, right? Mm -hmm. In my opinion, and you may completely agree and the listeners may as well, but it, 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 it requires so much courage that you might get to the point of like the go button, right? The, the button that says, okay, make it real. And the problem with you might be like, man, I'm so scared that this thing might actually be successful and I have to do the thing. I have to I mm -hmm. deliver so I can appreciate the, the juxtaposition of perfectionism and actually releasing something. Because the fear gap between those two pieces can weigh heavy on the person doing it and ultimately may just cripple you and you never do it. And I'm glad that you got through it and did it. Yeah, but for me, it's a no brainer because quite honestly, this is in my mind, this is the coolest project that I can work on in this phase of my life. So uh, really there is no option for me. It's, I, just, I, just, I just want to do it so badly. And I think it, it can be a great offering for many. So, so maybe a good uh, segue would be to uh, talk about who might have influenced you. And so here on the show, we call that question, who's your programming hero? Mm -hmm. Could be professor, could be mom and dad, could be high school teacher, could be whatever. But who is the hero in your life? Who is the influencer in your life, programmer or not? that said to you, Lotsi, you got the talent to do it, do it, or here's how I encourage you to do it. Who's your hero? Well, well no, nobody has explicitly told me to do the Yohishki, but I, can, I, I look up to, to a couple of people for sure. For example, the, the first uh, person that comes to my mind is John Carmack, <laughs> probably because I, I played too much Doom back in the days and I, and enjoyed it a little bit too much. Right. But, uh, I, I think it's it's crazy that he could he could uh, develop that engine back in the days uh, to to smoothly run on 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 those those PCs. And we there wasn't OpenGL or any high level APIs, and he had to implement it from from the ground up. So I think it's a, it's a major accomplishment. Yeah. And there is Jeff Atwood who created uh, the um, Stack Exchange that we're co-created. Uh, Jeff's been and on the show before. Coding Horror. He's been on the show before. Great guests. Yeah. So uh, so easy to talk to as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, super smart guy. Yeah. Very capable. Yeah. Yeah. Smart so, entrepreneur as well. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the way they built Stack Exchange and. And now Trello is a part of, you know, the ramifications, to use that word again, to, you know, the ripple yeah. effect of, uh, of doing what they did with Stack Exchange and all that what was, was what we know as Trello today, which we use here internally at the changelog. Yeah, honestly, what would we do without uh, Stack Overflow? <laughs> we, right? we forgot the program. <laughs> we'd be lost. We'd be, yeah. we'd be just uh, coders in the dark, so to speak. Coders in the dark. Yeah, uh, another guy is Dean Camera. Uh, author of the Lufa library, this uh, USB AVR library. I think it's a it's a beautiful piece of software. I mean, so so well and cleanly written. Uh, he may not be that famous, but I, I look up to him. And and he's pretty young, by the way. It's, uh, I'm not sure about his age, but he's young and mm. very talented. Yep. 
That's it. Good. Well, those are good heroes for sure. We, you know, one of the reasons why we do that segment just for listeners sake that, that have been listening to the show several times, and like, you know, I always love the, the heroes part of it, but why? And I think that maybe this show is the best place to earmark that is to say that, you know, there's somebody, as you've said, that has influenced you, whether it's directly or indirectly to have the courage to do what you do. And I think that's the best reason why, like who is your hero and pretty diverse John Carmack. And, and I wouldn't say that uh, Jeff Atwood is any less of a John Carmack, but he did not create what he created, which was like the doom stuff, but he did do some pretty cool, you know, with stack exchange. Mm -hmm. I mean, so he's not nobody, oh, yeah. but they're very, they're very different. You know, they're, they're into it to a degree, polar opposites gaming. And then, you know, uh, yep. enriching developers lives. So it's always mm -hmm. interesting to see who's influenced you. And, uh, I guess the last closing questions, given that we've talked about the UHK, the open source that, that powers it, and the promise and the platform that you're going to give to uh, software developers and hackers around the world through this uh, hardware software combination, the only question I, I can think of to close the question to close the show would be, uh, what's on your radar? Like, what's on your open source radar? What's on your software radar that's uh that's got you excited that if you had a weekend that you weren't doing uhk stuff um you know what softwares what projects would you be playing with and, and why mm -hmm. is it interesting to you yeah so i'm interested in the whole javascript ecosystem and uh, within that the angular interests me and i'm looking forward to angular 2 I would I would love to build agent on top of Angular too, but right now its, it's API is in flux. And other than that, I'm interested about microcontrollers and yeah, all kind this stuff. Yep. Good deal. Good deal. Well, I will say only because I have to that um, that I did notice that you did say Angular earlier. And I didn't go deeper on that for a reason because that's not what the show's about today. Okay. However, <laughs> there are some conversations I want to have with you around Angular that we're not going to have today. So listeners out there thinking about that, feel that I feel your pain, wanted to have the conversation about it, but it just didn't make sense to have that conversation today. So maybe maybe some of the time in a blog post you can talk about why Angular for you versus okay. all the other options, obviously. IoT platform are also super interesting. I, I would like to build a smart home if I had time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Lassi, it has been an absolute pleasure to dive deep with you on this ultimate hacking keyboard. I think that the promise, the platform, the open source, and everything we've talked about today is something that our audience and hackers around the world will resonate with. So if you love this show, go on Twitter, mention it today, share it with a friend, do whatever it takes to share what Lotzi's doing and his team with this keyboard. And if you totally appreciate it uh, and you use it and you buy it and you get it next July when he ships it, uh, well, maybe not in July in particular, but somewhere in those, those few months thereafter, uh, and you love it, you know, it may be months and months away from now because it's just it's just near the turn of 2016. So we're, we're a few months away from that. But if you get to that point and you're listening to this show and you're thinking, man, I love this thing, tell the world and point back to the change log and, and share what the story is about. Um, so Lotsy, thanks so much for coming on the show. Is there any, any closing thoughts you have that you want to share with the audience today before we close out the show? Well, there is nothing else on my mind, to be honest. I thank you very much for them. I appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Totally. It was great having you. Um, well, I do have a few people to thank. I got, uh, obviously, you, the listeners. We couldn't do this show without you. Your ears are very important. Um, and we thank you so much for listening to this show. And to our members who support us, if you go to changelog.com slash memberships, let me make sure that URL is correct, because I always forget if it's plural or not. It is membership, not plural. I'll, I'll add a redirect to memberships to membership. But nonetheless, if you go to changelaw.com slash membership, for 20 bucks a year, you can support what we're doing here. We give you access to our members-only Slack room. 
exclusive discounts from our favorite products and most trusted par partners, unrestricted access to our archives, which can be Googled, but nonetheless, you can't find them easily just by clicking around the site. And then also, if you want a change law tea to outfit yourself with, we give you that basically at cost, half off, and because we love our listeners and our members. Uh, we also love our sponsors. Those sponsors are CodeShip, Top Top, which we mentioned. So Top Top, big shout out to you today on the show. Harvest, love tracking time with Harvest, and Linode. Linode is awesome. VPSs that are just tried and true in Linux. Easiest way to get up on the internet with Linode. Thanks so much to those guys for supporting the show, and thanks so much to you, Lotsy, and everyone else for joining us on this show today. And with that, let's say goodbye. Thanks for that. Thank you.